Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this week's episode of Lifestyle Pirates with me, Big J, and him, Adriano. G'day. So this week we're welcomed by Nick Bendel from Hunter and Scribe, copywriter by profession and a man of many hats. Nick, good evening. Great to be here. Call me Big N. Big N. Big N. Oh, I've got competition this week. I love this. <laughs> big, big J and Big N. Oh, what are you? I'm a big A. <laughs> <laughs> I could have told you that without, yeah, without Big N being here. Where does Big N come from? <laughs> well, I'm a Sydney boy. Okay. So what does that mean? That means born and raised in Sydney. Funnily enough, I, I hear an English accent there, John. 100%. I lived for a few months in Southampton, which I really loved. Yes, yes. I, after finishing... Not a bad football team back in the day, bit of Matt Letizia. Oh, yeah, back in the day, I like that you added that. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was still there while I was living in Southampton. Really? Yep, he was still there. Uh, I think they were still at the old ground, the Dell. Yes. I think they were about to move to the new ground, and I, I love living in Southampton, a beautiful place, but apart from that, being a Sydney boy. So how does that big N? <laughs> yeah, it was still <laughs> <laughs> I was like... So Southampton, yeah, Big yeah, End, yeah, yeah. Sydney, Big End. Mm. Talk to me. Uh, well, I may have just made that up right now. Okay. Oh, oh like lovely. This is the kind of character we have on our show, ladies Excellent. and gentlemen. A compulsive liar. Um, <laughs> we're going to have a candid, very Candid. I'd, I'd rather candid. Yeah. Mate, what took you to Southampton? Well, I wanted to do a working holiday in England mm. and I didn't know where I wanted to go, but I did know that I didn't want to go to London because I thought if I'm going to go to a big city full of Australians, I might as well just stay in Sydney. Valid. So I arrived at Heathrow, had no idea where I wanted to go, and I went to the train station, and the next train to leave was going to Southampton. So I thought, that seems like a pretty good place to go. It's, it's one thing I love about Australians. So uh, my wife's Australian, so I, I've got a little bit of a disclaimer here, but you guys are taught just to go overseas and explore and kind of go walk about, quote-unquote, English would never do that. We would never, well, I know I wouldn't, but most English would never just turn up and just swing a compass and go wherever they want to go. So I'm, I'm, I think that's so, that's so very cool. What are you, cool, bizarre, like unpack that a little bit. What do you mean? Like we just, we don't just go anywhere. Well, well, I think Nick's just proved that you do. Well, what do you mean? He said England and then it's obviously part yeah, of the Commonwealth. So it's not just, you know, he's going to... But you don't see a point Felix. on the compass and then just go, I'm going to go to Southampton. Like That's not on the traditional you know, backpacker's guide oh, to the you, UK. If you follow football, it is. Well, I'd yeah. argue that's different as well. Big do you N. support Southampton? Do you, follow, do you follow football, Big N? I do. I, I'm a Southampton supporter okay. and, a, and a Sydney FC supporter. Well, there you go. On the back of your trip to Southampton? Well, I already had a bit of a soft spot for them. So yeah. if you'd asked me at the time which Premier League team I liked the most, I would have coincidentally said Southampton. Uh, but that wasn't why I chose Southampton. That was the next train, and when I saw it was Southampton, I thought oh, it, it was meant to be. All right, well, maybe there is some truth to what you were saying. <laughs> that was the next train. <laughs> so just for everybody tuning in, the reason I'm niching in on Southampton is because it's super narrow when you get to the UK. So I guess it's the equivalent of going, I landed in Sydney and went to Dubbo. What do you mean by super narrow? Like only one-way streets or...? No, no, no. <laughs> no it's just quite... It's quite niche, like it's not on any tourism guides. Yeah. When you, as a as an Aussie backpacker, it's, not easy. it's a great place. Okay. You've got the Dell. Yeah. Um, good football team as well back in the day. I yeah. can't pass about it now, but it's mm. it's super niche. I'm, I'm intrigued. Yeah, cool. What else did you do in the UK? Oh, I, I didn't do much else, funnily enough. Did I, you do the European thing? I, I did. Uh, on the continent, though, I, I didn't really travel around England, which I now regret, Was I, I love history, mm, yeah. and there's so much incredible history in England. So yeah. at some point, I do want to go back there and, and thoroughly explore Britain. Yeah. Mm. Fair play. Well, mate, you are a copywriter by profession. Um, I did a marketing management degree back in my day, and my rationale behind that was every company needs marketing. So it was very, very wide. I thought, I'll learn something. I'll get a BA, Bachelor of Arts. Cool. And that will stand me in good stead, I hope. Copywriting is very niche. How did you arrive at being a copywriter? Well, I <laughs> so, so when I finished school, I knew I wanted to go to university, but I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I think my mum suggested you should do journalism because you kind of like writing. So I said, okay. So I studied journalism, didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I seemed to like it and seemed to be pretty good at it. And... Then after finishing uni, I, I then spent the next 10 years or so just travelling and doing odd jobs and it was only after that spell of travel that I then 
became a journalist, I figured, well, I've studied and I might as well do it. And to begin with, I was hopeless at writing. I, I thought I was good. But once you gain a little bit of skill at something, you realise how yeah. bad you actually are. That's so true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then through practice, as with anything, you do the practice, you, you get better. And, and the more I did, the better I got, the more I loved it. And eventually, back in 2018, I started my own copywriting agency. So just a little bit about copywriting for people who don't know what a copywriter is. What is a copywriter? It's someone who writes professionally, but yeah. it's slightly different from a journalist. A journalist is writing news stories or, or stories yeah. to entertain, whereas a copywriter is more about business writing for marketing purposes. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know it was actually mainly focused on business writing and stuff like that. So you're not just given... you. You need to know what to write about. You, you're not supposed. You're not expected to know everything, right? So when you have to write copy for, you know, a particular business, do they give you sort of all of the jumbled words, and you're supposed to make it sound pretty? Like, is that is that pretty much what it is? Or it, it can definitely be like yeah. that, Adriano. So yeah. sometimes they will have a draft that yeah. they want you to clean up. Sometimes they won't have written anything, but they'll have a few bullet points. But a lot of the time. There's nothing. They actually want you to come up with the ideas because even thinking the ideas is a skill that, that you need to learn and they don't really have the time. So they want you to think of the ideas and do the research and then present it all in a nice little package to them. Yeah. So you have to come up with ideas as well. Yes. It's slack on them, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you charge for that as well. We do. Accordingly, of course. <laughs> so with the journalism side of things, let's go back to that bit. How are you taught to write, if you're studying journalism, how are you taught to write and articulate things? Because one of my interests, I'd love to get a journalist on here, by the way, or, or a news reporter, because they all sp tend to speak in a very monotone, non-emotional, and I assume that's to try and kind of evoke just telling a story rather than a, you know, create emotions and create panic and fear. How are you taught to write as a journalist when you're reporting on things? Interesting you should talk about the monotone because... You're almost meant to write in that style. You're meant to write in a neutral, objective, unemotional way and it should be concise and you're meant to do a thing known as the reverse pyramid which is normally when someone tells a story they tell it in chronological order from A to Z but with a reverse pyramid the first thing you say is the most important part of the story and then the second thing you say is the second most important part of the story and the third thing you say is the third most important part of the story and the final sentence should be the least important part of the story. And the reason being, most people who start reading a new story don't finish it. So if someone stops reading a third of the way through, they've got the most important information. So you're meant to write in a different style to how someone might expect to write. There you go. You heard it here first. That's why you have clickbait. It's to get you to read the article, the headline, and then not even finish the rest of the thing. Once they've got your click, you can't get it back. Mm. <laughs> so... Me being um, someone who likes shapes, a pyramid, <laughs> a pyramid means it has to come back up, doesn't it? Oh, <laughs> you, you got me on a technicality. Yeah. Oh, it's more of a crescendo or so, like dropping down or, and it's not supposed to come back up? No, it's not meant to come oh, back up. But I'd like to finish. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. So I just like shapes. So that's actually how you're taught to write, is you write with the headline in mind first. And this was, so how long ago? Not to give away this, any age. I, I was at uni from 97 to 99. So this is the best part of a many years ago. A century, yeah. And, and, and so you were taught to write with that article first, headline, get it there, and then basically assume that your reader is not going to read the whole thing. Exactly. A, a lot of news writing these days is different. It's less objective. It's more emotional people writing it have some sort of agenda. So they mm. don't always write in that traditional style. But if you read an article by an old school journo who's maybe 50 years or above, mm. it'll almost certainly be in that style. And if you compare the first sentence to the last sentence, you'll notice that the first sentence is far meatier than the last sentence. So how do you write without sort of subjective bias? Well, it is impossible. Yeah, but like uh, it must be super difficult. It is. We, we can't completely rid mm. ourselves of bias, but... You're meant to give it your best shot. Yeah. Yeah, I would struggle with that big time. <laughs> I tell you, people exactly how I feel. Could you write about a car without subjective bias? Oh, if it was the Italian car, yeah. <laughs> that is bias <laughs> right there. <laughs> I rest my yeah. case. So when did you make the flip then from journalism to copywriting? Because that seems as almost like you're going from 
one side to the other side. I won't call it a dark or light side. You're just you're making a conscious decision to to move across. That was in 2016. I I love journalism, but unfortunately, I felt like it was a bit of a sinking ship since the internet came in. That's really disrupted the model of media companies, mm. and it's become harder and harder for them to make money. And as a result, they've been sacking journalists left, right, and centre. And as I said, I, I thought it was a sinking ship, so I figured I, I still wanted to write, but mm. I needed to join a company that had a different business model, and, and so that's copywriting or, or content marketing to give it a different name. And I did that for two and a half years or so, and then I started my own business. So awesome. c- so copywriting is only for... It's uh, basic as it sounds like for words. It's not for video or... Oh, good, good, yeah. good question. Yes, it, it is just for words, but you can do the equivalent with yeah, video. Yeah. Yeah, because surely you can just speak those words. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. But I can imagine you. you yeah, you'd write a script, right? So yeah, of do, course. Sometimes we might need a script. <laughs> <laughs> or you can do a podcast for business purposes or for yeah. marketing purposes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. And and so how did you niche down? Because you, you own a business. You're a co-founder of another business. You sit on an advisory board. You're a video presenter. You have written a book. You're a toastmaster. Like that's a lot of stuff, but I can imagine it all filters back down into your your key, which is the copywriting side of things. Yeah, the, there are a few things that, that relate to each other. Over the, maybe the past, I would say, seven years, I've really been on a bit of a journey of professional development and personal development and trying new things and growing as a person and each little step leads to the next little step, which leads to the next little one. So all these things are kind of related. Uh, I, I think probably the main thing is, even though there are some distinct things there, the common element is me trying new things and trying to push myself and trying to grow. Yeah. What led you to the personal development journey? Well, funnily enough, I, I used to think it was all a load of nonsense. And well, personal development? Yes, yes. Okay. It, it just seemed like hippy-dippy bullshit to me. Mm. I So back in 2015, I became editor of a magazine uh, the, uh, whose audience was real estate agents. And real estate agents are really big on personal development and professional development. So as part of my job, I had to start going along to these seminars and listening to podcasts. And to my surprise, it it really resonated with me. And I suddenly thought, oh, why has my mind been closed to this for so many years? And so that's how I got into it. And I I didn't go all in to begin with, but just you put your your toe in there and then you put a leg in there and then uh, one day you wake up and your whole body's in there. Mm. Was there a sort of catalyst thing that you heard that was like, you know, that really clicks with me or was it just sort of erosion and it wore you down into this <laughs> <laughs> into this personal development world? I, th- I think it was probably more the second one, Adriano, but it was, I think because I was forced to listen to it for my job and because I wanted to do well in my job, my mind was suddenly open to listening to it, whereas before my mind had been closed and the moment my mind was open it suddenly all made sense to me what was the bit what was the what was the aha moment i I don't know if there was one aha one aha moment but the the thing that really stood out to me was because i had always been really into self-education i've always been a compulsive reader so it's not like i'd shut myself off from knowledge so i think what appealed to me was the idea that oh my God, there's all this knowledge that's out there that I I never paid any attention to mm. and now I can see that there's so there are so many things here that can help me uh, in a psychological sense or that can help me in a business sense or that can help me in a personal sense and, and now that I know all this gold is out there, I, I just want to discover it. Mm. And that's a challenge as well because you've got to be open to receive. Like there's a wealth of information out there so you've got to be open to actually breathe that in. But then the other piece is you've got to find the channel that resonates with you. So as you said, there's a load of podcasts out there, there's a load of books. You've got to kind of find the one that, or the author or the entrepreneur that's written their own thing that actually resonates with your journey at the time too because you can waste a lot of time, eh, maybe not waste, but you can go spend a lot of time going through things and it doesn't doesn't absorb. But then there's one that you just go, yes, that's, that's a good one. Do you have one that you can sort of put your finger on? Yeah, I like. Um, I'm a big podcaster. I, I struggle to read actually, mm. um, just because I don't have the attention span. I'm a big podcaster because I like the the dialogue element. It, yeah. I almost feel like I'm sitting at a table uh, with two people talking. Um, probably hence why we do a podcast. But I like Diary of a CEO. 
uh, with a guy called Stephen Bartlett, and I like the High Performance Podcast, and they tend to talk to a lot of uh, business owners or entrepreneurs or sports people, athletes, um, entertainment people, and just I like the human mm-hmm. nature. I did do a lot of Joe Rogan um, when it was probably about an hour long. Yeah. And again, I like that conversational element, uh, which is probably what we're trying to achieve. His original studio. Yeah, well, look, I, I like the conversation element because I'm, I've never been a big fan of like, here's five points to get rich quick or here's five points to, for the best copywriting or here's five points to find the best real estate or what, what have you. Uh, it's, for me, it's always a journey. Mm. And maybe that's just kind of my personality or because I'm in sales or what have you. But they're the ones that I like and resonate with me personally. But I've been through a hell of a lot where you just go, this, this voice is annoying, which could be the same for a POM. Um, or I just don't like the person that the way they articulate stuff. It's it's quite interesting. Mm. So that'd be me. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Um. So talk to me about the journey, man. Like, so you're a co-founder. You're Toastmaster. You sit on an advisory board, video presenter. What's the purpose of having all these hats? Is it purely self development? Is it kind of BD generate business for yourself? Is it just to get your brand out there? Is it learning? Um, and I guess the reason I ask is so myself, um, I work, I am a buyer's agent by profession. Um, I also run a networking community, also do the podcast with Adriano. My purpose is all about just working with people. I've discovered that I love people, I love helping people, I love giving people a platform. So it's all very personal related uh, and bringing people together, whether it's over a beer, glass of wine, lunch, helping them buy property or over a podcast. Um, what's the kind of story with this this kind of conglomerate that you've got going on here. It, it was all the things you mentioned a moment ago. Part of it is learning. Part of it is personal branding. Part of it is business development. Mm. And part of it is just trying, uh, just uh, personal development and trying to grow as a person. I, I wanted to, when I started my own business back in 2018, I, I realised that I needed to put myself out there more, which I wasn't really doing. Mm. And it was a bit scary to begin with, but I realised if I could build a personal brand and if I could make people know me and my company, then I'd be able to make sales for my business. Mm. I I didn't have any sales experience, but I I knew that a business can't survive without sales. So that that was definitely a large part of it. And then part of it was also the skills you need to learn to do all all these things I thought would be important. And the mindset you need to do all these things I thought would be important because I've definitely become more more growth-oriented since I started doing all of this and also more resilient. Sounds like it was out of your comfort zone. It, it was mm. to begin with. I, I remember the first video I published, I felt <laughs> incredibly self-conscious. Mm. Maybe one reason was that I recorded it in a cemetery, which was probably a bad decision, <laughs> but... As a copywriter, the conversation was pretty dead. Yes. <laughs> oh, stop it. Uh, really? Yeah. The, Why did you choose that sort of... Uh, well, <laughs> this is going to sound odd. I, For some reason, I, I don't know why, but I concluded that I couldn't record the video at home. I don't know why. So then I thought I need a quiet spot. And there's this park right near me that I thought would be quiet. And in the background, there are all these tombstones. So I, I didn't record it literally in the tombstones, but in the background, there were just all these graves and it just looked really weird. So the first lesson I learned with videos is don't do them in a cemetery. <laughs> it was a stiff competition. Mm. Oh, John, stop it. That's deep. That's deep. <laughs> it's not bad. What was your first video? What was the content? It was something... Rigor mortis. <laughs> <laughs> it was something about marketing, something about, I think maybe if you're not doing marketing but your rivals are, they're going to win customers at your expense. I think something along those lines. Mm. And it was recorded at a cemetery. Yeah. And so what was the feedback you got from that? Because there's a, there's a big moment here where I think a lot of people, um, I think I'm one of them as well, is that you, you get a bit of imposter syndrome where you've got something that you feel is of value or you're told you're good at what you do and you don't know how to put it out there. So that first video is it's quite a leap of faith. I wouldn't have done it next to a cemetery, granted. In. Um, we just do a podcast. But like... What was the feedback you got from that? Well, this was a crucial thing. I didn't get any feedback, which was actually good because one of the reason we one one of the big reasons we don't put ourselves out there is we're we're worried what's everyone going to say? They're all going to judge me. They're all going to be critics. But then the moment you put something out there and you're met with deafening silence, you realize everyone is so busy thinking about themselves that they don't have time to think about you. 
and that was actually liberating and that made it easier to keep publishing content. And I also knew that it would be very hard to begin with, but the more I did it, the more comfortable I would get. And maybe after 25 videos or so, I completely stopped feeling self-conscious. And now if I publish a video, it doesn't bother me at all. So if it had gone south, what would you have done? So if you'd have got a load of negative feedback, so we all know that the Facebook algorithms and LinkedIn algorithms work on negative. So if the first few comments are negative bias, then that will trend higher, you'll get more attention, all that kind of stuff. If they if they go positive, then you don't tend to see that. If you'd have got negative bias and comments and feedback on your first video, how would you have felt? I think I would have kept going because before starting, I'd set myself a goal of publishing 365 videos in 365 days. So I had mentally committed to that goal and nothing was going to stop me, not even a cemetery. So for our audience, 365 videos in 365 days, that's one a day. <laughs> oh, thank God I was going to do the math. I saw you writing notes. <laughs> that's yeah. what I say. Um, so I've, you mentioned, that, you know, you're doing copy and then you've gone from that to sort of building a business and then doing sales. For someone who doesn't consider themselves a salesman, how did you sort of make that transition and was it comfortable? How do you become from someone who starts a business to selling your business? What sort of transition is that and was it comfortable for you? It was very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> but there were two things that pushed me. First, I knew that if I didn't make sales, the business would fail. Hmm. And then the second thing is I looked at the pain as... I framed it as a positive. I thought this is going to make me more resilient and I'm going to learn an incredible life skill above and beyond <coughs> needing to do this for business purposes. And so although it was inc- excruciatingly hard to begin yeah. with and I felt so uncomfortable, I forced myself <coughs> to keep going. And now, even though it still feels a bit unnatural, I'm far, far more comfortable with it than when I started. Mm-hmm. Any tips for starting out in sales? Oh, okay. I, I'm not the best salesperson. So when I call someone I never try to talk them into it I just say I'm Nick I've got this thing do you want it and most of the time it turns out they don't but so (laughs) so so maybe the the only tip I would I I can't give anyone any fancy dialogue all I could say is just keep knocking on the door and Mm. eventually someone will say yes yeah so more of a numbers game yes Mm. I think it's a begin. yeah I think as a copywriter you could you could probably go into (laughs) just I've been on your website I'm trying to work out what you do Mm. Well, I, I have done things like that, but again, well, I, I've tried various things. The, the things I've tried, which seemed really clever at the time, didn't really work, and maybe because in my heart I just felt, I don't know, like, like a sleazy salesperson, I don't know. So the thing I'm most comfortable with is basically just calling someone up and just saying, I've got this thing, do you want it? Mm. And psychologically that I'm most comfortable with that because I don't feel like I'm being pushy or talking anyone into anything. Mm. If they say yes, in fact, almost all the time when people say yes, they'll say, oh, my God, I've actually been meaning to do this. Mm. Or oh, we were just having a conversation in the office yesterday. And so that that's very reassuring to me. They already wanted to do it. I, I didn't force them. So maybe that's why I take that approach. Mm. Copy, copywriting, I think, is a lost art because I, I can imagine you get a lot of business owners – that they have the vision and they talk on their website in how they would articulate their value proposition rather than talking from the value they can add to the client or the potential customer, they look at it from their lens. So I can imagine you have to do a lot of reframing in terms of the language that's being used to make it obvious for said audience. That is such an astute observation because one of the big mistakes a lot of businesses make with their copy is they say we do this, we do that, instead of talking about the customer, you will get this, you will get that. So to all the listeners, if you have a website and if you're saying we or us or our, that's probably the wrong language to to use. You want to see if you can replace those words with you. Mm. Instead of we do this, you should phrase it so that you will get that. Mm. It's super interesting, actually. Mm. Go on, talk to me. No, no, I've just think, thought about so many situations where I've been in where I've spoken, uh, mainly through email though. It's always about our, this, we. It's never about you uh, offering what we do rather than what you get. So yeah, anyway, super interesting. No, I'm with you because I, I tend to write how I talk, mm. which isn't always the best as well. Mm. So And it's fairly fairly common from that side. I'm not saying that I'm... I, yeah, I can articulate myself, but I tend to write just in terms of my language. But of course, not everybody gets that because they don't have the context or the tone. 
So, mate, walk me through this um, 500 lunches. Okay. Now, you're talking to a guy that loves a long lunch. You're talking to someone that loves meeting new people. Um, what was the genesis of the idea? I stole the idea off an amazing woman named Kaylee Chu. She's in Melbourne, and in 2018, Kaylee had 100 lunches. And then in April 2019, I was on LinkedIn, and I saw a post from this woman, Kaylee Chu, who I didn't know, and she mentioned, I've just finished my book about how I had lunch with 100 strangers last year. Mm. And I remember thinking, that is so bloody weird. Why would anyone, why would anyone have lunch with one stranger, let alone 100? Mm. And who did she meet, and what did they talk about, and what did, what did she learn? And... There was a link and I clicked through to her website and there was some information about this book she'd just written. And we spoke before about being in a particular frame of mind where you're open to new things. Mm -hmm. This was not long after I'd started my business and I had this thought that I needed to put myself out there and I needed to grow. And so this was the right book at the right time. This was a book about personal growth and overcoming challenges and building your network and becoming better at socialising, better co at communicating, all things I felt I needed to do. Mm. And so I immediately took out my credit card, bought a copy. The book arrived a few weeks later. And I think from the first page, I thought, wow, this is incredible. I'm going to do what this woman did and have 100 lunches. But at some point in the book, Kaylee mentioned that her 100 lunches had been so enjoyable and so beneficial that even though her goal was 100 she had kept going. Mm. And I thought, if I'm going to get to 100 and keep going, why call it 100 lunches? Why not call it, I don't know, 500 lunches? So nice. that's why I decided to have lunch with 500 strangers in five years. And Kaylee Chu in Melbourne was my first lunch. And I actually flew to Melbourne just to have lunch with her. And what does Kaylee do? What's her profession? At the time, <clears throat> she... <laughs> this is actually quite strange. She was, at the time, in sales, even though she suffered from really bad social anxiety. Mm. Since then, she has uh, she's moved into public speaking. She's got this incredible story. She's a fantastic speaker. I've seen her speak a few times. She's given a TED talk. She's also runs these, uh, I guess, personal development groups, uh, teaching people about confidence and about personal growth. And I think she does a, a bit of branding work as well. But she's built an incredible social media presence. So I love this, and the reason why I love this is because. In a post-COVID world when we have flexibility at work, so I've, I've been brought up on a long lunch. So I've, I've done sales for post-18 years. And yet you're still so thin. <coughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. You can come back. <laughs> um, and I know that I, my relationships that I have are deeper. Um, if you were to think about it as a ball of twine or a ball of string, um, the, the, the twine gets thicker the more you know someone, the more time you spend with someone. Adam Grant will talk about this. It takes X amount of hours to actually build a meaningful relationship. My concern with the generations of, of that working from home culture, the Zoom culture that's going to come through is they're not going to have these, these deep and meaningful relationships. So the long lunch thing, I know it's very cliche, but for me, there's, a, there's an organicness in the same way we do the podcast of a conversation where it can just meander through and you can build a better, meaningful, more significant relationship than you would do in a half an hour Zoom conversation. I couldn't agree more. And I actually, I can uh, speak for both both camps here because I, I describe myself as an antisocial introvert. I'm definitely not the sort of person who is naturally inclined mm. to be social. My idea of a good time is staying at home on my own, reading a book. So uh, having all these lunches was very much the opposite of what I would normally do. The, my typical behaviour was to think, why would I want to meet all these people? Mm. What, what good is that going to do? But since I started having all these lunches, I've discovered exactly what you said, John. I built all these really deep relationships with people and met all these people I would never have met and built these relationships I would never have had and learned these things I would never have learned. And I've been amazed to discover that that yes, exactly what you said is spot on. When you meet these people and you really have these deep conversations, it builds an incredible relationship. So I love that. So as uh, an, an antisocial introvert, I'm taking that. How would you approach having lunch with a stranger? How do you, how do you control that environment to make you comfortable? Well, I, I think 
maybe because I've always framed it in my mind as being a positive thing, that this is a great adventure and I'm going to learn some new things and this could go anywhere. So I'm always really excited and positive about all the lunches. And so I think as a result, that allows me to, to feel comfortable. How do you initiate that lunch? How do you how do you initiate a lunch with a complete stranger? You don't just walk down the street, boy. Let's go. <laughs> no, but I might start doing that. I, uh, <laughs> most of my lunches are organised through LinkedIn. I'll yeah, stumble yeah. upon someone's profile. They look okay. interesting. I'll send a, a message. Probably ninety five of my ninety five percent of my messages are either the person doesn't reply or occasionally they'll reply to say no. So ninety five percent of my invitations get rejected. Yeah, I've been there. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different story, listeners. Because this is super <laughs> interesting, right? Um, to completely cold message someone and ask them out for lunch. I'm, this is fascinating. Um, all right, so one, what's the opener? The rejections, how are they? If they're just not paused, they're just silent. Like, so how do you open the conversation? Uh, so the message I send, it's something along the lines of, hi, Adriano, this is going to sound a bit odd, but... I'm in the process of having lunch with 500 strangers in five years. So far, I've met 249 incredible people. And then I link to an article I've written about it so that they can see that mm. this is a legitimate yeah. thing. Okay. And yeah. would, you meet, would you like to meet sometime for lunch? Mm. And almost uh, for the people who say no, almost always the way they say no is by not replying. I've only ever had four or five people actually get back to me to say no. Okay, yeah, all right. So, yeah, so not a lot of people actually write back. Um, strange dietary requirements. <laughs> <laughs> Not because I own. eat everything, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got to get some food to yeah, yeah, yeah. This is going to be two fifty. Yeah, you can. Yeah, no, we're two fifty one. <laughs> you can knock off two. Valid, valid. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, dietary requirements. Like, how do you? Wh- where do you go out for lunch? Like, you're just like, all right, we're about to you. Let's meet somewhere here. Yeah, that, that's generally it. So if the person says yes, I'll then mm. say, well, Adriana, where where do you live or where do you work from? And then I will either suggest let's meet in the middle or I can meet you near your office. Okay, you both rock up. You don't know what each other – actually, you do know what each other look like. looks like. You sit down, all right. How do you start? Often they're very curious. This is, fasc- like, this is so bizarre to just <laughs> complete strangers and you sit down and it's like, all right, what do you do? Well, often they're very curious. Often they, yeah. they start asking me a lot of questions, which is great. Because I've always been more of a listener than a yeah. talker, although that sounds odd because then I'm answering the questions. <laughs> but uh, you're a copywriter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but uh, what I like about that is they're, it's, it's something that makes them comfortable because they're now asking questions and I guess they're easing into it. And so that usually breaks the ice. And then sometimes... We might just be asking each other rather superficial things to begin with. I don't know, where do you live? What do you do? Mm. What are your hobbies? But then that somehow tends to lead into some sort of deeper conversation. Yeah, There's a dance. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. There, there, I, man, dance. I love it because I'm, I'm picturing it in my head. I'm like, it takes a lot of balls to do that. All right, I'm, I'm an extrovertive introvert. Mm. <laughs> All right, so like I act like an extrovert, but I'm quite an introvert. Ah. Um, I love video games, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, to just go out with a random and just you know sit down, talk shit is like fascinating to me, absolutely. So yeah, like hey, I don't think I'd be able to hold a conversation for that long. <laughs> yeah, unless I talked about cars, football, music, wine. But that's the thing, right? So this is where a lot of people get um, anxious: is they forget that everybody's a human. Mm. And so you've just mentioned two or three things that are fairly common, right? I don't want to burst your bubble. Wine, cars, video games, music, sport. All mine. All yours. You're not the only guy (laughs) that likes that stuff. So, and I guess this is where, to Nick's point, when you've had a connection on LinkedIn, you can see the person. You can there might be some mutual connection sometimes as well. So you can do a bit of background in terms of like who's this person, what are they like, um, how are they going. But if you can find a common ground fairly quickly, in the same way we've done tonight, right? Nick and I, we've never met each other. We've, we've connected on LinkedIn in exactly the same way because I was curious to learn about this 500 lunches just because I like a lunch and I want to get in by. Um, <laughs> but you can find a common ground quite quickly and that's just through having a conversation. Um, my curiosity, Nick, is like what do you want to get out of this? So when you mm, get to yes. 500 or even actually at 249, what are you getting out of it? Apart from just some 
mega meals. And by the way, who's your accountant? Because I want to know what that fringe benefit tax looks like. Um, no, seriously, who's your accountant? Um, but like, what's what's the purpose for you? Is is it building content as a copywriter and having a kind of Rolodex in the back of your mind for different perceptions and different points of views and different personalities and different industries? Um, is it building a network? And there's no right or wrong answer to this. Is it, what? what's that kind of, when you reflect and go, right, I've done 500 lunches, I've had some cracking meals, I've had some shit meals, I've met some banging people, met some, I bet some people that like sport, wine, <laughs> cars, you know. Yeah. What, what, what's the piece, right? What's, what's it, what does it look like for you? Well, there were a few reasons I wanted to have the lunches. And as it turns out, all, all these things I was hoping for have come to pass. Mm. I was hoping to become better at socialising, better at interacting with people. That's happened. I was hoping to strengthen my mindset. That's happened. I was hoping to build an incredible network. That's happened. And then I was also hoping to learn a lot. That's happened. And I guess I was hoping to have an incredible adventure. And that's definitely happened as well. I To go back to the accounting question, I actually don't claim any of these meals because I said up front that I, I didn't want to try to turn any of these people into clients. And so therefore, it's not a business thing. It's a personal thing. You have no one from the ATO that listens. It's okay. It's okay. But you did hear it first. So you're footing the bill for all of these lunches? Well, generally we pay for ourselves. Oh, nice. uh, but I'm certainly paying for my yeah. lunches, yes. Oh, okay, sweet. What's been, and I don't want to hear any names, all right? What's been the best place you've gone to for lunch? Oh, okay. Uh, well, actually you can plug a restaurant, that's okay. Mm. One notable location, I don't know if I'd call it the best, but... Uh, this particular person, uh, Paul, who was lunch 162, I'm going to say. I love uh, that. What? I love that. What? <laughs> number, number 162, you legend. <laughs> Paul, big shout out, Paul. Uh, Paul, great guy. He very generously said, "Let's, uh, I'll, I'll shout lunch and let's meet at, oh, I'm just trying to think of the name of the club, a club on Macquarie Street. But I, I remember you needed... Australian club? Yes, I think that was it. And you need to wear a suit and tie, which was very uh, odd. I, mm. I hadn't been to a lunch in a suit and tie. And that was a very plush venue. That, uh, and funnily enough, I ordered a schnitzel at this very plush venue. Uh, can't beat a schnitty. No, you they, can't. They do a good schnitty. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that venue definitely stands out. And, and one other that stands out, I'm going to say lunch 188, Matt Brown. We were meant to meet at a restaurant in Manly, but then for reasons that I can't recall... He just said, oh, why didn't you just come to my place? So we had lunch at his place. That's awesome. And he cooked? No, we ordered in. Oh, okay. Is Matt Brown the DJ? No. Okay, sweet. Sorry. <laughs> I love the fact you remember people by numbers. I, I generally do, yes. Do you keep a log? I, I do have a spreadsheet, yeah, you yes. Have to, yeah. I love that. What's been the worst? Like, And I know, you, I know you've come into this with, um, with open eyes and I guess a certain amount of vulnerability, mm. right? You know, you, you're open to grow build your connections all that kind of stuff what's been the one that you've another one of no names but like what's been the one that you've come away from going what a waste of my time I, I can honestly say there haven't been any bad ones however there have been maybe four or five where there just wasn't any chemistry with the other person yeah mm. which is just completely the luck of the draw my yeah. personality their personality you yeah. never know how they're going to come together yeah. and the lunch was a bit strained and we were both forcing ourselves to say things. Uh, so four or five of those, they weren't bad lunches or bad experiences, but they were a bit uncomfortable. Oh, like super awkward sort of thing? Yeah, like, oh, I guess I better say something now and oh, you better say something yeah. and, uh, oh, is it time to go? Yeah. Excellent, thanks. It's like when John tells a joke. <laughs> 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 Even I laughed at that. <laughs> and so you, you enjoy your schnitty. Mm. What's been the worst meal? Oh, the worst meal? Mm. Where you've gone, oh, I really don't want to pay for this. This was appalling. Actually, I can, I can remember a very there bad lunch. Please don't name the restaurant. <laughs> no, it, it was in Chatswood. It was a Chinese restaurant in Chatswood. It was lunch 11. Actually, the guy I met, Chris, was an incredible guy. We got on so well. And I remember that it was this weird... I think they, they served chicken and yet for some reason it was covered in grilled cheese. And it was just really weird. 
at a Chinese restaurant. Yes, that, <laughs> that's I also bizarre. found that weird. Yes, I know. Just as a disclaimer, that's not even a Western version. We don't even do that in the UK. Yeah, I, I found that all very weird. Thankfully, though, the the bloke I met, Chris, was fantastic. And, and like, who's been... Um, so you're on 249. And it's, the reason I ask is that we're on episode 65, I think. I thought it was 63, 64. Okay, we're <laughs> mid-60s. And... And we've had a ball with all of them, but there are some obviously that stick out, right? In the same way that you'd have great nights to stick out and, and all that. Like, who's one that you'd go? That was that was a real pivot. That was a real just like wow highlight in my spreadsheet. You know, maybe you put it in, <laughs> but maybe put it in bold because there's a bit where I don't know. We've got a circle of friends, right? So if you look at Dunbar's, if you had a Dunbar's theory, oh no. So Dunbar's theory basically looks at your your pods of friends and excuse the numbers because they're not they're not exact but the, the the further your friendship circle goes the less deep the relationship so you have this kind of pod let's just say for argument's sake kind of 25 to 50 let's just say 25 is your family and some intimate friends and things right you then have uh, kind of let's just say you're 50 which might be some really close friendships and then you go further and further linkedin connections but the reality is is that you go the the more intimate the deeper the relationship as we spoke about earlier then it's just a numbers game, right? So which is why when you look at LinkedIn, it's not about the number of connections you have, it's about the depth of the relationships and, and as we know in life, right? So you're going to have lunch with 500 people. There will be some really beautiful relationships that are spawned from this. If you were to look at 248, 249 that you've had, what are some that you just go, you are going to be in my life forever? And you go, others, oh, you're just going to fall from the wayside. Like that's That's just the way it goes. That that's definitely the case, John. Some people you just hit it off with. Yeah, your personalities really click, and maybe you have a lot of things to talk about. So there have been some people where I've become good friends with and, and <laughs> seen them many times since our initial lunch, and then there are others where it was uh, we weren't as compatible, mm. and we still keep in touch, but it's maybe more of a text message relationship or a social mm. media relationship. So, so yes, there is definitely that mix. I would say of the 249, there, there are maybe, say, 15 people who, who I've just gotten on really, really well with and become close to. And then there's a lot of others where it's uh, got on well but, but not as deep and then just a small number of people where we got on fine but it was just, just awkward. And has it helped you um, professionally not only from a development side but actually professionally in terms of writing content, does it give you different views, thoughts, perspective when you're speaking to people from different spheres? I No, I, I wouldn't say it's helped me as a writer, but it's definitely helped me as a person and as a business owner because it's made me, it's opened my mind more, it's made me stronger, it's made me more resilient, it's made me more proactive. So it, it's definitely been wonderful for my personal and professional development. Yeah. How does it how has it made you more proactive? Because the the act of so I've organised two hundred and forty nine lunches and <laughs> that's bright <laughs> and then there've been more than a thousand other people I've contacted who who haven't yeah. replied and I've I've then f- kept in contact with with these people so it's it's made me realise that you can just ask complete strangers for things. And people sometimes say yes. For example, one of the most memorable lunches I had, number 130, was with a hostage negotiator named Steve York. Wow. And someone gave me the idea to have lunch with a hostage negotiator. And so I did a Google search for Sydney hostage negotiator and I found some guy, Steve York. And I didn't know who he was. And I I tried to find him on LinkedIn. I couldn't find his LinkedIn profile. But then somehow, I, I don't even know how, I through a Google search, I found his mobile phone number. What? And I thought, oh, should I, should I give this guy a call? And before starting these lunches, I would never have called, but I'd developed this mindset where if you just put yourself out there and you ask for things and, and if you're proactive, Adriano, the worst that can happen is they say no. Hmm. So I called him and I was so nervous and to my astonishment, he said, yeah, sounds interesting. Let's have lunch. And that was an amazing lunch. And that, and that came from this new mindset, this proactive mindset that I developed. 
what did you talk about with him? Well, <laughs> I, I was so fascinated and I just peppered him with questions and to my astonishment, he answered all of them. Yeah. I just wanted to know what it's like to run a hostage negotiation and, and how do you get into the mind of a hostage taker and mm. what do you talk about and, and what are they like? And as I said, every question I asked, he answered. Yeah, yeah there would be so many questions you would want to ask him. There were. Yeah. Who, who paid the bill on that one? I think that that one may have been me. Yeah, he probably <laughs> negotiated that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. <laughs> <laughs> Any athletes? Uh, yes. Uh, number 102, Joey Peters. Mm. Uh, Joey is one of Australia's best ever footballers. She's in the uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, she played for the Matildas. Yeah. Uh, so I'm tr- just trying to think, were there any other athletes? Can't think of any other athletes. John's available. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a long lunch athlete. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Specialized. And, and and so when you when you when you get to 500, uh, and that will be the lifestyle pirates. We'll we'll, we'll circle that <laughs> off for you. What's um, what's that look like? Like when you when you sit back and go right, I've had some cracking times, met some good people. What do you want to have achieved? And and the reason I ask that is because what I love about what you're doing. It's actually very Simon Sinek. I don't know if you realise this, but it's very... You brush your teeth, you just do it, right? As a, as a, as a cadence, as a rhythm. Um, you go to the gym, you get better over time, you get more fit, all that kind of stuff. You've adopted that same mentality by going for lunch, which I love, because it's like you want to put yourself out there, you want to make yourself vulnerable, you want to get better at talking to people, engaging, build your network. When you get to 500, what does that look like? I think it'll be very very exciting because it'll feel like i've accomplished this incredible goal Mm. and i think i'll be a better person because there'll be still a lot of personal growth between now and then but i I think also that that won't be the end of my journey because i'm sure i'll keep having lunches yeah Mm. so you 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 strike me as a person that's always really keen just to learn more and absorb and and i guess add value rather than taking value and where does that come from Oh, good question. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> it's just something I was born with. Yeah. Mm. No, I'm, you I'm, seem to be someone who pushes yourself in out of your comfort zone. Uh, these days I am. I mm. didn't used to be. This goes back to, uh, I, I mentioned discovering personal development yeah. in, in 2015 and then I became consciously aware of pushing myself out of my comfort mm. zone and what that meant and the benefits of it. Up until then I hadn't really done it. And especially since I started my business four years ago, now I really deliberately do it because i realize the benefits but so this is the new nick yeah but the old nick this is no, a big n yes it yeah. is <laughs> little n didn't push himself out yeah. of his comfort zone <laughs> and it gets easier every time yeah it does because you realize that even though it's uncomfortable that yeah. you've done it before and that if yeah. you keep pushing you can succeed yeah, it's no longer alien I've exactly done it a few times so have you found that with your lunches actually that's a really good point so have you found that from lunch one to 249 do you kind of walk in a bit more like you mean it and, and that you own the place or like, but is there a bit more strut, right? So I know for me, for example, again, you got to back yourself, right? So I know sometimes I'll walk into a room like I own the damn thing and I know no one in the room, <laughs> but it's it's self-confidence. So have you, and I get the sense that you're doing this for, for kind of building your building confidence as well. Have you felt that that's developed over lunch one to 2.49? Yeah, I, I would I would say it has, John. Some something that I have to keep reminding myself about is the people I meet. This is their first one. Yeah, and so sometimes they'll say, "Oh, I'm really nervous," and I'm like, "Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. This is your first yeah. one." So for me, it's just it's so normal now. And yeah, I, I guess I I don't really. To me, it's normal. That's probably the best way of describing it. It doesn't. It, they're really enjoyable, but they don't seem special in the sense that I'm now accustomed to them yeah. whereas for the other person it does yeah mm. random one just thought of it um you're a married man no so uh, do, do you have to kind of if you if you were to approach a young lady or or a female entrepreneur or something do you have to kind of go hey look this is part of my project I'm not I'm not being stalkery mm. <laughs> that's when I send the invitation on LinkedIn part of the reason I send a link to an article I've yeah. written is yeah. to allay that fear yeah, <laughs> yeah of course you'd have to qualify why <laughs> yeah because hey. <laughs> it's never worked for me. No, <laughs> can you share me that link, by the way? No, no, it's not your article, buddy. Yeah. It's not your article. 
Yeah. Who would you? So we used to we used to ask in season one. We used to ask a question actually. Who would you want to have lunch with? So if if you had a dinner, do you remember this question? Yeah. I so if you if you could have dinner with three other people, who would they be? Regardless of LinkedIn, what, who would they be if you could choose any three people to have dinner with? Dead or alive. Dead or alive. But One they're of alive them. if they're dead. If you okay. <laughs> so it's not just the corpse. Like, okay. Yeah, they're, they're, could be people from the past. Well, I have been to a cemetery before. I've shot some of my best videos there. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm, I want a copy of that video. I've, I've done all my cemetery jokes. Yeah. I can't do anymore. Link in description. <laughs> Uh, Adam Goods would be one of them. Two others. I'm for people that don't know who he is. Who is he? He was John. (laughs) I know who he is. AFL player. Uh, AFL player. Yes, Sydney Swan star, and he was the 2014 Australian of the Year. Mm -hmm. He would definitely be one. I'm very interested in politics, so I I wouldn't mind meeting a politician if it can be someone dead. I wouldn't mind having dinner with Stalin. Mm -hmm. He was fascinating. He would probably try to poison me during the dinner. (laughs) So I'd have to be very careful, but yep. he'd be very, very interesting. He yep. would be very interesting, and maybe some sort of famous soldier, maybe Alexander the Great. Right. So you love your history. I do yeah. love history. Does that help in your profession? Oh, that's a good question. I think I think it probably does yeah. because a lot of what I need to do as a writer is research. Yeah. And if you're into history, I, I think that makes you more open to doing research. Yeah. What I love is that we've nearly spoken for an hour on your business and you're not actually plugged the name. So do you want to let people know what the name of your business is? <laughs> it, it's Hunter and Scribe. And where mm. does that come from? That comes from a friend of mine. When the business was started in 2018, I was very self-conscious, I guess, because it, it was just one dude out of his bedroom and... This was before the pandemic, before people worked from home. And I wanted, I didn't want people to think it was just one guy working out of his bedroom. I wanted people to think that this was a really big, well established company. Mm. And when my friend suggested the name Hunter and Scribe, I thought, what a great name. Hunter and Scribe is a big company. Mm. There are probably 50 or 100 people who work for Hunter and Scribe, and they've been around forever. And it just sounded like such a great name. Mm. I love that. I love that. So one thing I need to ask, I've got to get this off my chest. <laughs> what is a Toastmaster? Toastmasters is a public speaking organisation. I think it's in about 150 question, 150 countries. Oh, okay. Well, don't I feel sheepish? I'm <laughs> definitely not a Toastmaster. You can go along. <coughs> We'd what, love to have you. What, what, is it, what does it do? You, uh, you practice a mix of long prepared speeches and Mm. shorter semi-prepared speeches and then very short impromptu speeches. Petrifying. Yes, and that's actually why I went along. I thought it would be good to learn public speaking. I was very scared of it. Most people who go along are. And so you you learn how to become a better speaker and then also part of what you do is you evaluate other people's speeches and so you you also learn how to give feedback to others. Oh, Jesus. So on that note... Anxiety just thinking about (laughs) it. On that note, how do we go tonight? (laughs) Well, so what I would do then if I was doing a, a Toastmasters evaluation, I, I would probably think of a couple of things you did well Then I might offer a couple of areas where you might be able to improve and then I might summarise what I'd said and, and with an emphasis on the positive. All right, we'll do that off mic. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds like it could be another hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Nick, thank you very much for coming on Lifestyle Pirates tonight. Um I want to help you flip the, flip the script a little bit here. So if you want to catch up for Nick for lunch, drop him a message on LinkedIn. Don't make him reach out to you. He's still got over 200 lunches that he wants to meet people. Thank you for telling us your story. I love it. Unless you and I go for lunch, I'll pay. <laughs> we'll go for sourdough toast. Um, <laughs> Toastmaster. But really enjoy talking to you tonight, mate. I, I love the way you've put yourself out there um, to build not only your, your personal skills, your development, but your, your business as well. I think that's been super good and really, really poignant for I think a lot of people that are working from home at the moment that don't know where to start because they're super comfortable in their Ugg boots mm. sitting at home in their pyjamas on a Zoom screen. So, mate, thank you very much for sharing your story. Thank you, Big J. Thank you, Big A. It's been <laughs> an absolute pleasure to be here. We've never met, but it feels like we've known each other for a million years yeah. and it's been such a pleasure to be part of this wonderful podcast. Mate, you're very welcome. Thanks for giving us your time, Big N. <laughs> <laughs> and little N. <laughs> <laughs> Take care.